What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Masters of Sport, and I'm here with my co-host, Earl Kunkel, also the co-author of Parabolic Periodization. Yeah. Scribing <laughs> skills. So, Earl, I'm excited to not talk about video games. Good, we're not. But rumor does have it. As a child, you were not allowed to play video games, right? They were, like, kept out of the house. So you were uh, deprived, like, hand-eye coordination <laughs> skills. You know, sort of, like, the narratives of games like Final Fantasy VII just hitting you right in the feels. The musical soundtracks and all just... Especially stuff. Final Fantasy VII. All the artistic work that goes into it and, like, all the skills. Like, you ever see, like, the credits at the end of the game? I, I, wanted to, I want to clarify. We weren't totally deprived. Of, of this it was or 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 not allowed to i would say it was my parents were like you have to buy the gaming system and so the whole rule was no matter what we had to buy it and we got a nintendo i want to say i was in like fifth grade okay. and my we got it because my auntie on my mom's sister bought it for us as like a gag to my mom. <laughs> and my mom was like heated. And so we had we had the Nintendo for I'd say like I don't know, four or five months. And my mom had a yard sale. And we had a we lived next to we lived like in the middle of nowhere, especially at the time there was nothing around us, but there was actually a mushroom farm right next to us. And some of the workers had come over and they were buying stuff from my mom's yard sale. And the one guy asked if we had a gaming system. He was like, do you have a Nintendo or a Sega? And we said we had a Nintendo, and he said he would pay us 50 bucks for it. So the three of us, me and my brother and my sister, got yeah. together and were like, well, 50 bucks, that's going to end up being you know, decent money for us at the time. So we sold it to them, and they actually played it all the time. But <clears throat> long story short is like, we never, we never played video games at all, yeah. really, until... Puzzles, problem solving. Just... Well, we played. Oh, we did puzzles. Oh, okay. So board games. Just as long as it wasn't electronically, you yeah. were all about the board games. Yeah. Like, what board games you play then? Well, I wanted to tell you my Gran Turismo and Max Payne stories. But... Oh, oh, oh. Cause, whoa, whoa! This came out of nowhere. This is a first. I want to hear this. That was the problem. Is it was like the. <laughs> That's more like PlayStation era, though. Yeah. Like, so my it... brother, when he went to college, bought a PlayStation. And he brought it home, and I was, like, just graduated high school, and we were playing Gran Turismo, and I got, like, addicted to it. I and believe that. Dude, my, my one buddy lent me then, going into my freshman year of college, an X Xbox, and I played Max Payne, I beat it. I beat all three levels of it within four days. Because I just got, I got, like, obsessed with it. And I sat there, I'm like, probably good that my parents didn't let me. Because I just wanted to play like constantly. Um, I'm gonna tell you if you ever get a PS5 or I, I think you can do it on PC. Elden Ring comes out in January, and you I don't know to, what that is. I'm just saying, like, if you want something that's hard and challenging, it's gonna be like, dude, I have to keep going. I, I can't yeah. stop. Like I don't your want type that. of mind. You might. You never know. <laughs> I know like, I want it, but I don't want. I it. want it in my life. I'm waiting for it to come about. So but, we were allowed to play like board games. Right. though. What board games you play? Uh, yeah, real quick, my dad like taught me how to play chess when I was like maybe kindergarten. Like yeah, just yeah. these paces move there. Yeah, and he would just destroy me every time yeah. on purpose. Like it wasn't like oh you, you messed like, up. It was just you. like no, nah, I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna ruin you. Yeah, every time. <laughs> That's the best way to teach people. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Actually, okay, so we we uh, like the first board game we learned was chess. Okay. I'd say like. We sort of learned checkers first, which is lame. Um, checkers isn't lame, it's fun. It's, it's like an easier way to learn chess, I think. Uh, so we learned checkers and like backgammon, and then we started to play. Um, then we got into chess early like that. And I think that, I think learning chess, I know you, you hate this from a pretentious point, is similar to like playing piano though. You should learn it Dude, early all on. All my kids. Okay. Have been given Even piano lessons from like six years old. Like I, I, I'm all about that lifestyle. So I think <laughs> chess is similar in that regard. And then it was, dude, we would play full steam ahead all the time, all the time. Stratego and Risk, all the time. Like we would play Stratego. Like we'd come home, we'd go downstairs, and we'd start playing Stratego. You like, like to be the blue or the red pieces. I didn't care. I just wanted right. to. How did you use your spy? It depended. It depended on how I was playing with my brother. Oh. 
Dude, Dude. I, I have some, I, right now, my brother hasn't beat me in like five uh, games, okay? Uh-oh. He, the yeah. last time that we played, we were drinking at my buddy's house because we play a drinking game around it now. <laughs> he took the, and I, I actually went to Harrisburg and bought a classic Stratego game for like 150 bucks. It's sick. <laughs> and I beat him. He got so mad. He flipped the table, and I lost a piece because he was so mad. Like it, it, and that's like the whole, uh, yes. the intensity of the of Stratego and Risk. So, so Stratego and Risk. I played Stratego. I don't know if I was any good at it. No, I had problem finding other nerds sometimes to like yeah. play games with. I don't know. Maybe it was just my lack of social skills too. <laughs> but um, did you ever do like Dungeons and Dragons or anything like that too? Like I, I played it a couple times, but I. I I never got into it, but I I did appreciate the game itself yeah. and and Catan like oh uh, yeah similar C- Catan is my new family yeah game. that's a great family game like we get in fights yeah often Caitlin's whole family would play Catan and, and it's it's a really really good game like my oldest daughter is like if you don't stop talking this way I am gonna quit I was like go ahead quit you can lose <laughs> like flat out like <laughs> hold no punches. And then, like, my middle daughter, like, she'll make a, you'll make a move that, like, blocks something she wants to do, and you can just see her whole world fall apart. <laughs> and, it, and it's funny, you're like, yeah, you're just smile, and I look at my wife, and she's, like, laughing, because she knows I'm, like, I'm ready to start needling, and she'll do one of these, like, don't say that. It's like, all right, let me go put a record on. Let me go. Yeah, it'll be a little bit easier. Yeah. All right, so... I'm glad you you did play some video games. Yeah, that's probably why you're so good. Like seeing the movement with the um, the lifts and everything, and the throws, and picking out all those fine. Because I played video games. Because you played video games. <laughs> no, like legitimately. Like I do think there's there, especially like look, I would play Madden when I go to my friends' houses, um, and it is, dude. I remember playing Madden made me. When I would watch NFL games, I would write plays down. I would record on a VHS, okay. and I would I would record like the Colts when Peyton Manning was playing for the Colts. I would record plays and watch what he would do on the play, and then think about that when I would go play Madden. <laughs> so it's like it did like it, they are good to a point. Like if you look at like your your sixty frames per second or like your thirty, depending on what it's running or whatever, and like you start being able to see those pixels and those little jumps and things <laughs> like that. Like there's some dude out there, a person who who's beat the original Mario in like four minutes and fifty four seconds, yeah. which is like I guess based off what they do with the task runs, like when they program a, a robot to like run it so it's like perfect. That time is like nearly identical. The human has gotten that like that quick, that precise on hitting the movements and seeing the pixels and doing the things. There, there's like YouTube videos on like people going over this, and it's so technical. I'm like, oh my goodness! I was like, I feel like almost like I want to watch one of these tonight. Yeah, I'll tell you who the channel is because I don't want to just give free vibes <laughs> out to anyone. But I'll tell you then. All right. Speaking of like, sort of like. Masters of sports, right? Charles Poliquin. Yeah. Master, right? Like, yeah. I would say. Yes. You would say so? All yeah. Right, I'm glad he has your vote. Yeah, he definitely has my vote. I, I, I think he... I think the best part behind him was his packaging. He comes across in... in when you see him speak at some points, uh, I think especially closer towards like the last 10 years of his life, he, some people got rubbed the wrong way by him. Uh, but I think it, he, he was like genu- extremely genuine, cared a lot. I mean, dude, he had a heart attack when he was like 35 or 36. Oh, wow. And a lot of people felt he had, a, he had that uh, heart problem early because he was so intense they they like he would work with uh canadian uh bobsledders and and luge guys um and that's how he one of the guys that i i knew from poliquin andre benoit he he was trained by him uh for lillehammer and i think 94 um in the luge and they were like dude he was he's so He's so intuitive, and he, but he had a severe anger problem, so he would lose his mind if people didn't do the okay. lifts properly. Like, what are you doing? Yeah, yeah, like get pissed that like they were going off track. How are you at the Olympics and you can't do this? Why right. don't you listen to me? Yeah, exactly like you. that. But, but I think like one of the downfalls was 
he also is so intelligent and would use these monstrous words, right? It could be intimidating to a point because you would hear him speak and be like, wait, what? what is he saying? And then, you know, you'd have to piece together like everything that he had, that he was given to you. It's like the curse of knowledge, right? Yeah. You know, here's a master, he knows so much. How does he like lose that knowledge to be able to like... I think the biggest thing with Paulo Quinn is that he was very good at taking big like scientific concepts and getting and dumbing it down for idiots. Yeah. To, and this to is consume. even with his like huge vocabulary. Like, you know, he's using yeah. some big fancy word and he looks around and he's like, Dane doesn't get what I'm saying. Let me <laughs> let me rephrase this for you, buddy. All right. Like that type of like Yeah, yeah. And and even like talking with Adam Nelson who actually trained with him directly. And Nelson was like, dude, on top of that, like, he's really good on the floor, like, train as a, as a strength coach. He was like, you just, you felt like you needed to train harder because, because of the way he would push you. He was so intense. Now, does that intensity come from, like, sort of, I don't want to say cues or something, like the feedback he gives? Or does that also come from, like, you know, sort of, he is Charles Poliquin, too. So, like, when you're on there and he's asking you to do something, like, you have to step up your game because that's who you're dealing with. Yeah, probably a little bit of that because I think by that time uh, that Nelson had worked with him was was uh, into 2004. It was, like, 2003. And by that time, Charles had really, I believe he was one of the main starters behind T-Nation. Uh, and so he was well, very well known at that point in his career. So I, w- I would say that's partially going to be part of it. But it's also, like, you know, he... To get the adaptation that he wanted, I think his intensities were were extremely high. Okay. Uh, and he worked a lot. You know, he worked with, you know, Niel Diggs was one of the best linebackers in the, in the NFL for a couple of years. He worked with a lot of guys that were NFL guys that were also around at that time. So he would talk to adults <laughs> how you talk to 12-year-olds, correct? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. Probably not. I'm trying to think. I mean, how I scream at like Junior. Yeah, yeah. Maybe a little bit, but less. Maybe slightly less vulgar. Yeah, but you although never, he was vulgar too. Let me also clarify for everyone. You yell, but you never put down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, no one's yeah. ever put down. Yeah. It's no, more I, like you are better. Yeah. Be, like it's that's, always uplifting. Yeah, I think that that's exactly how he would would have been in the yeah. in the gym. It's not like, here, let me cut you down and make you feel small. It's like, yo, I need more from you. Like, Yeah, and I, I th- that was just a feel I got from him individually. It was like yeah. that. So is Poliquin part of your, like, origin story? Like, I know you, Dr. B's one of those guys for um, you. I would say to a point, I would say to a point, yes, uh, especially because of, you know, I, I went up to his place three to- two or three times in Rhode Island. Um yeah, I would say two or three times. And, like, the way um, learning how he tests people, um, learning how, like, he he would analyze someone's structural movement, um, taking the concepts and, like, applying it directly into uh, the actual training, I thought was extremely valuable and, and definitely took me from... What I had learned myself, it, it, it gave me like the critical thought of everything that I had learned separately from Dr. B, but then also what I had learned with Dr. B, because I, I saw Poliquin after uh, Dr. B. Okay. So the whole reason I saw him was because Adam Nelson hit me up after working with Dr. B, and, and I worked with him for a couple months, and he's like, dude, you, you've got to go up and learn from Charles. All right. And so that was like the whole influence of it. Man, so like I almost, I had this like image in my mind, like Dr. B was like your Obi-Wan. Yeah. And then Charles was more like Yoda, like there, just like, look at this, here are these big concepts. And it's just like you probably being a little, I don't know, Luke does leave and come back to Yoda at some point, but just more that second in that line of like sort of teachers and that like master's realm. Yeah, I'm even trying to think about it in a Star Trek term. I don't do Star Trek. That's okay. like where my nerd just has no... Nerd. Okay, like, so I, I would I'm say weak. to a point, Yoda might be a little above, but I think you're probably yeah, right. Though. A little too much. Yeah, I think you're probably right. Maybe a more intense yoga, or Yoda. Yeah, yeah y- Yoda. We're doing Bikram now. Yeah, we're going <laughs> full full blown heat hot yoga. Yeah, hot. <laughs> I th- I think the thing the thing is is like 
by so the by like 2007 2008 when I or 2008 was when I went up there in 2009 he had sort of went from being a training having a training center in Arizona and being being like part of T Nation and and putting out tons and tons and tons of content he was still doing putting out a lot of content it was I believe he had some substantial investments put into him and into the company and into his supplement line <clears throat> and so a lot of it was getting focused towards strictly business focused stuff okay now when he learned that um, that like I was around dr. B and and worked with Nelson I had talked with him uh, once on the phone where it was like okay you worked with Adam what did you do with dr. B and stuff and he was clearly like into your story to a point like he wasn't it wasn't like no i'm holier than thou like okay I'm not gonna so he was trying that. to learn something from you probably yeah. too yeah see yeah what for he sure could, he could get from you well dude he he had um um kim goss he had kim goss sit down with me for like a half hour and interview me and kim goss started bigger faster stronger and he's he's a crook he's a total crook and that that was also i think part of charles downfalls that he was working with him is that okay. he's a total liar, and I hope he's watching right now because he's an absolute yeah, or listening. He's literally just scum of the earth, and he wow. he took that interview and wrote articles on T Nation and and cited things from Dr. B and didn't cite me. And at the time, I was like 25, 26 years old, like looking for a break, and he didn't. And then you know later on, I would see him at weightlifting competitions and just mop him up, and actually about. Uh, three years ago at the Arnold, he was standing there and I stole his clock like three times uh, in a weightlifting <laughs> comp. And I was like, Kim, you're you're a total clown. And I, I literally just went off on him. And then he, he didn't remember me, emailed me last year, uh -oh. upset that I called it Olympic weightlifting. He's a child. But I think being around guys like that, that actually... just be weightlifting? Yeah. Oh. I think that actually had a negative impact on Charles long term. Uh, and what led to him actually getting, like, taken out of the Poliquin Institute was being around guys like Kim. Gotcha. Which sucks for him. That Kim guy or whatever his name It is? sucks for Charles. Yeah. Because Charles is, like, a genuine dude who who probably didn't have much interest in running a business. He had much more of an interest in actually just getting his, yeah. his stuff out there. A dude you were saying you don't like, he yeah. sounded like a... One of those people who wants to pretend like CrossFit never happened. Yes. And wasn't like the best thing for weightlifting in America. 100% like, that. 100%. Yeah. yeah. Like, oh, we would have been fine with that. No, you no, wouldn't. Like, you wouldn't have. Look at how much the totals that you need to qualify for events went up. Right. Because yeah. of that. Yeah. The quality no, of athlete it started bringing to the sport. Exactly like, that. Yeah. Anyway. No. But I, I think to go back, the biggest things that I learned from, from Poliquin was... <clears throat> Testing your athletes, experimenting with them, uh, the similar stuff from Dr. B. Utilizing bodybuilding uh, for, for different issues that, that like, like integrity problems that you might have, especially if you're, if you're in a unilateral sport like throwing, uh, where you're favoring your one side all the time, using bodybuilding to iron that stuff out, and just constantly looking for other areas, other coaches who are who are a step ahead of you. Like, I think that was, like, the biggest thing for yeah. him. So he was a learner. Right? Big time, like, yeah. It's like, hey, let me find these. I'm also, you know. He's the one who put me on to Dottillo. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he was one of those, like, dude, you got to read this book. And I was like, what? And I bought it, and I read it. I'm like, dude, how, do, how have I never heard of this book? Yeah. You're the one who told me about that. I got that, too. And I, I loved reading it because it's so... He's like more broad in general with yeah. like what he's saying. Like he's not like specific. Like oh, go do five by five of this. It's like yeah, get up to ninety percent. Hit this all right. Yeah, you're good. Do Power twelve racks. sets. <laughs> yeah, train for four hours. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's just like it's it's just so conversational. It's yeah. like almost like I'm like, did my grandfather write this type <laughs> of thing? But like the the thing is like it forces you as the reader to think about it because yeah. it's a broad con like it's a concept. Yeah. It's like all right, how do I apply this concept and I don't know. Just me, I like that. I like being. I like a blank. I don't want to say a blank canvas. Like I want some parameters to do things, but I want some within that parameter. I can be creative. Yeah. Like yeah. don't tell me use green. Cut like there's a number here, and I have to use green there. Right. My right. Color right. Like yeah. give me a little freedom. Maybe I want to use lime or something. Like that. <laughs> All, right. All right. So Charles, not quite Yoda, but like that second in line, and you're sort of 
your growth as a young coach, yeah. right? Yeah. Gaining that knowledge, like getting sort of finding confidence. Dr. B, you told a great story about um, the daughter, my wife or whatever out yeah, to here, yeah. uh, my mom out to <laughs> my daughter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was, do you have like a Charles Poliquin story of some sort that you could share that, I don't know if it can top that, but just, It's you know. definitely not gonna top that, but <laughs> one, of the, one of the things was, um, so he had his supplement company, I don't know if they still do it, I don't think that they do. And what was nuts is when you would go to the, their, their, the institute, the Poliquin Institute, you could just, like, they weren't, when I was there, they were like, you can use whatever you want. They should have been charging us extra to use it because I was just like killing it. <laughs> but I noticed there was like all different types. There's krill oil, and this is the other. He was ahead of, of his time with that, where he had krill oil, uh, fish oil, um, cod liver oil. Uh, but but mainly, I remember he was like the first person I had seen that had krill oil. Um, but er he everything for him was coming back to fish oils. Uh, during this time, and so this is like 2008, 2009, and so Clark Flynn was there, who uh, was a bobsledder and a weightlifter for Canada, and uh, one of his friends that he had trained, he had, uh, Poliquin had trained at the center in uh, Calgary, and so they were sort of standing around, and, and Clark has draft horses, and he lives in Ontario now, and, and he still does. He has draft horses, okay, and they're these big huge like you could he would, he would describe him like oh you can with his thick canadian accent you could sleep across the back of his of of his back he's, that's how wide he is but he's got a bum elbow or whatever the joint is and so he's going on talking to charles about how he's got a bum elbow and and he's he's just you know doesn't look the best right now and charles picked up on like well, what is his, is his uh, skin shiny or the hair or the fur, whatever they call it on horses, I don't know. I don't know yeah, either. I have no idea. My equus skills are not that good. Yeah, maybe Jason knows. The mane, so the mane wasn't as shiny as, okay. as it could have been. Um, but Charles had like picked up on that immediately and he's like, wait, so he doesn't look as healthy uh, in his mane or fur, whatever. He needed more conditioner. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, so then he's like, and it's his elbow, like his, the way he plants, he sort of picks it up. He doesn't, he doesn't put a lot of weight on it and he's a working horse, so he, he needs to do this. And so Charles starts telling Clark that he should give it fish oil, this draft horse. So long story short, they have like this full discussion and Clark's like, I'm not giving him fish oil. Charles ends up telling him the formula that he should give him fish oil, give the draft horse. So he becomes like full on chemist real quick. Yeah. Yeah, puts everything <laughs> together, and then he ends up giving Clark, and, and Clark was an instructor, an instructor like a, I guess like a 1099 that he would bring in, okay. and then he would leave. And so he was leaving, he's like, here, just take all this fish oil, I'll give it to your horse. And so I hadn't seen Clark since 2009, probably. Um, and, dude, full circle, weird, is that Clark, I did not know this, trained Tim Nedow in high okay. school, <laughs> who I l later ended up coaching. Um, but to go back to it, I saw Clark at a small world. Yeah, Canadian. Yeah, at a Canadian Nationals in Ottawa, and he's there just randomly. And I like go up and I'm like, dude, that's Clark. I, I haven't seen this guy in almost a decade. I'm gonna go talk to him. So I go up and I introduce myself, and he's like, I think I remember you being there. Blah blah. blah. And uh, and then I brought up the fish oil, and he's like, Oh my gosh, I remember everything. <laughs> Dude, I did that for a month and the horse was perfectly fine. And uh, like that was, that was a story. Yeah, I believe in this. I'm gonna yeah. convince you it's gonna save your horse. And your life. horse will believe in it too. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. So I think that's where it's like, even if it was like crazy voodoo, which I yeah. do believe there is evidence that fish oil could help in this regard. Yeah. But I think the effort alone is like. He has a pr Clark has a problem. Charles could help fix it, and he cared enough to like try to fix well, it. Well, even to your point where you think he was more about like the training and like doing that to yeah. the business, like he just gave him the product. He was like, Yeah, he just it. like go, just go take it. <laughs> Here's my very like sought after advice. Here, yeah. take it, take it, like, and, and don't pay me. And you know, yeah. I mean, now he worked for him, but it's like I think that 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 was the. I mean, it's not as funny of, of a story, but it's still like the lesson is there, I think. Right, right. No, I hear it. Yeah. I learned something. Teach. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, all right. 
So what do you see, like, how do you see Poliquin's, like, legacy then in strength and conditioning? Dude, this is what's crazy. I wanted to, to interject this, so I'm glad I didn't, and I was more patient. Yeah. If you look at Poliquin principles, uh-huh. he has he has in there the, the tibialis curl bar. It's like the tib bar. And knees over toes guy is yeah. selling this now. You know, marketing as it as it his own whatever, but he, and but he hasn't blatantly like if it was me, I would be like, yo, I'm selling this bar, and I learned about it directly from Charles Poliquin. Charles, you know, stole this from this bodybuilder um, back from the '70s, because that's the one thing Poliquin was was also good at. He would always say who he was getting his stuff yeah. from. And so, if you look in Poliquin principles, there's a picture of the tibialis bar, and this was printed in like 1993. Oh wow! So it's like his his impact, I believe, is way bigger than than people will say. And, and for me, a lot of the stuff, the fat bar stuff that we do here, that's all. Yeah, from, you're all about that life, and that's yeah. All of our bars are fat bars, and that's all from Poliquin. All of our all of our football or Swiss bars that are are angled like this, that was all directly impacted by me in two thousand eight, two thousand nine with Charles. Um, Learning tell extensions. That's that's a exercise directly oh stolen from him. You give that everybody all the time yeah, too. Yeah. yeah, all the time. So I, it's like to answer your question, like, dude, he has a big impact on me, and I think in turn has a large impact on on sports performance. You know, you bring up the tell extension. And I'm just thinking, I'm like, how many different variations did Dane figure out how to give that <laughs> movement? Incline, flat, decline, yeah. chains, bands. Oh my goodness, <laughs> dumbbells. Easy bar, fat bar. <laughs> oh my, like, it's like from a creativity standpoint, it's like, here's one movement. Let's see how far we can mine this and how many different ways yeah. we can use it as a stimulus. Yeah. Oh. And it's all just doing the same try, and, try and we're, get... Yeah, we're not even getting into sets and reps yet either, too. <laughs> yeah. We're just like. Just to get you big triceps. <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness. I my The next question I wanted to ask was like, so what's the best movement then from Paula Quinn, like, that you got? Well, like, he was also hardcore into those step-ups. He called them Peterson step-ups, and that's the stuff that, um, that's the stuff that I do wish uh, Ben Peterson, or Ben Patrick, I, I, he talks about it, he does take, he does talk about getting those step-ups from Paula Quinn, but I wish he did it a little bit more. Um, and I, that was a big one, was a, was a short range of motion step up. Um, for me though, I, you know, another movement, triple jump step up that I, I got from him. But dude, he just, he just solidified for me because he was from a bodybuilding background and he also was big into powerlifting. Uh, he, he did some work with, with powerlifters and he did a lot of work with some of the best bodybuilders in the world. But he always would say, dude, nothing is going to beat doing the weightlifting movements. And people want to argue and they want to debate all this, but the science is showing this. So I think, dude, probably, probably like the, he used to call it, well, he used to, there was two movements. The split squat, he would call the telemark, the telemark split squat. So it's like telemark, like you're skiing. Yeah. Uh, that. The split squat, I would say, with a real deep. If you think about how knees over toes guy, yeah, yeah. Him, that was that's all from Charles, directly. That's basically, the thumbnail image of knees over. Yeah, toes. that was all Charles's movement. Um, and then for me personally, though, would be he called it like the cycling front squat, and it was heels super elevated front squat. Okay. And I would say that's what I would I would utilize the most now is some type of heels elevated with kids that are in high school because they they do struggle sometimes with uh with their heel position i always see that movement and i think of a woman in high heels or yeah whoever wants yeah. to wear high heels yeah. and i'm like oh you want that like teardrop that nice quad yeah, nice like, big hey, here you go. Yeah. Here you got you it for you. your heels and, <laughs> and back squat or front squat with your heels really high <laughs> yeah man all right, let's go to um, our audience questions. We got. I'm some. excited to hear our subreddit. Make sure you're you're going into our subreddit. Yeah. This is illustrious hyphen at eight nine nine eight. I don't know if that's at even there. I just copy it. Pretty much all sports are done unilaterally, so training unilateral strength is of course super important. But then, what are the benefits of doing bilateral work? For example, a back squat. Shouldn't every athlete do a single leg back squat instead because sports are often done on a single leg? I mean, I wouldn't say not all. 
like pretty much all sports are unilateral. Not really. I mean, I, they are. There's a all best. sports on TV. Okay. No, yeah. I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah. I I think it, it's important to to realize. I mean, that's that's a similar question to like, oh, well, I'm not I'm not gonna bench press because when am I on my back? You yeah. know, like I'm all, uh, and if I'm a wrestler, I don't want to bench press because I I should never be on my back. So it's like. I, I, that's just not the best way to think about um, adaptation. If you think about we're looking for a stimulus to provide an adaptation to the body, right? Or the body will provide an adaptation to the stimulus. Is that if you're doing a bilateral back squat, you're going to have a higher load. It's going to train your, your, your trunk a little bit more because you're having that higher load. Um, you're not going to favor one leg over the other. Or you will, but not as dominantly because the one downfall with unilateral work, if I would do a single leg, if I do my right leg first, my left leg will not have as much energy yeah. to hit it. So that's like one downfall with it. With it. Um, but you, you, you get a little bit more because you're more stable. You can handle a bigger load bilaterally so you can get a bigger response hormonally also from bilateral work. So that would be my answer. Yeah. And part of me just thinking like, and you can tell me if I'm completely off base with it, uh, this is like when you do unilateral like single leg squats, like I'm never moving like that. Yeah. You yeah, know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. Like, it's, it's still different from the sport. Yeah. It, it still changes and, and it, that way. In reality, it comes back to like, do, do both. Yeah. Just do both. And if I want to like really, you know, take that argument of like, well, you don't do this in sport. Well, then why would I do anything other than the sport? That's the, that's the whole yeah, point. Like if yeah. I want to just keep going, it's like, eh, because this will help you in this way. You, right. It's not direct. It doesn't need to be direct. Like it's like people who play poker and don't understand implied odds. Right, right, right. Like, <laughs> exactly, exactly that. Um, oh, this same dude here, same tagger name, illustrious head. Um, what are the best <laughs> holly lists for soccer players besides full cleans, which you covered in a video? Because I want to implement snatches and other clean varia variations. So which ones should I focus on? High hang, power snatch, high hang snatch, two box snatch, uh, two box power cleans, uh, behind the neck jerks. Because they're going to be in a position like that quarter squat yeah. position, and especially when they're on the attack or on the severe defense right around the goal. If you're at a corner, you are always in that position that you would be in from a high hang and two block or... No three block? No, no three <laughs> blocks. <laughs> Bastard. <laughs> This one's from uh, Jack underscore Chun. What are your thoughts on Muhammad Ehab's technique? His super dynamic and almost grip and rip first pull, speed under the bar, and aggressive footwork has always mesmerized me. Just wanted your thoughts on his technique and possible return at Worlds. I think my biggest problem with Ehab has always been how far behind the bar he gets. Okay, like he gets way, way, way behind, uh, and then he jumps like crazy. So when he does end up missing, if the bar is not in the perfect spot, like because he doesn't get his feet grounded quick enough and because he's so far behind, one, he's got to have really good shoulder mobility to come back through, uh, but also he's, he does miss. He's, he's a little bit more erratic uh, with his make ratio, and I think a lot of that is because he's jumpy. But he's a phenomenal weightlifter, dude. He's, he's I think, yeah, he's a, he, a silver medalist at Worlds, and, and I think in 2016 he might have even... Uh, I think he got silver or bronze in 2016. He's great. No, I remember the, I forget what year it was in Worlds when he went, like, he pushed Lou. Like, yeah, Lou hard. had to work. Yeah, hard. I think yeah. that might have been in Turkmenistan. Yeah, that was a good competition. Yeah, like, that so was like, fun to watch. It's, it's, you know, me nitpicking him, but he moves. He's still a great weightlifter. Yeah. You know. Well, Jack underscore Chum wanted to know your thoughts on it. Jack, thanks for that comment. Make sure if you have more comments for us or questions. Yeah. Hit us up in the subreddit or in the comment section here if you're on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Radio, or Apple Music, whatever it's called. Yeah. And continue to like, subscribe, ring the notification bell for Masters of Sport. Until next time, guys. Peace.